Good afternoon. Welcome to the Evershed Sutherland webcast, Virtual Currencies and the Regulatory Environment, a look around the globe. If you have any questions during the webcast, please submit them via the Ask a Question text box on your viewing console. Daily credit is approved for this webcast in California, Georgia, New York, Nebraska, and Texas, and is pending in, in Illinois and Virginia. If you'd like to receive CLE credit for this webcast, please download and submit the CLE sign-in sheets and evaluation forms. We will provide you with the confirmation code for you uh, to enter on your sign-in sheet. This webcast is being recorded, and the final version will be posted on the Evershed Sutherland website within the next week. I would now like to turn it over to Greg Kaufman, partner at Evershed Sutherland. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, my name is Greg Kaufman. I'm a partner in the Washington office at Evershed Sutherland uh, in the Securities and Commodities Litigation Group. On the, uh, the webinar with me today is Andrew Henderson. He's a partner in our London office in the financial institutions practice. And then we also have on the line Duncan Watt. He is a consultant in our Hong Kong office and he is also in the financial institutions practice, but also in the subgroup financial services disputes and investigations team. Uh, so uh, what could be more fitting than to have this presentation today uh, when we learn uh, that over the weekend, the Block One ICO completed its uh, uh, fundraising efforts for its EOS <coughs> token, and they raised $4 billion, the fifth most valuable cryptocurrency out there right now. Uh, they did not have a live product when the ICO completed. They do now, a blockchain application platform, and they are off and running. Uh, so it is a fast-moving uh, and uh, kind of a wild environment that we're in right now. And if there's any better example, then I think that Block 1 uh, ICO is a good one. So with that, uh, we're going to hand it off to Andrew uh, to talk about uh, the UK perspective on virtual currencies in the regulatory environment. Greg, thank you very much. Um, first off, I've just clicked the slide to, uh, in other words, initial coin offerings and introduction of thought should show up, so I trust it does. Um, what I'm going to do is to say a few words by way of introduction particularly um, to, that we were able to, to explain what we mean when we talk about cryptocurrencies and we talk, to, talk about blockchain. And then also really to just go through some of the discussions around the ICO process, teasing out some of the, the themes. Uh, we, um, we, we will, certainly I will touch on uh, some of the, the definitional issues that we have in, in the UK and Europe. But really, the, the, the point of these first 20 minutes or so um, are mainly to, uh, to, to just put, I think, a lot of what follows uh, into, into context. So I think the first point, um, really moving on to the next slide, is just to talk about the ICO process and, and just to be clear about terminology, um, starting really with what we mean when we, we talk about cryptocurrency. And it's a widely used term, perhaps, little understood. But we say that a key point about a cryptocurrency is that it is a digital virtual currency, and the term virtual currency is actually a legal term of art amongst European Union lawmakers, uh, that uses cryptography for security. And one of the advantages is that it's difficult to counterfeit because of the security feature. Uh, so a defining feature of a cryptocurrency, and arguably its most enduring allure, is its organic nature. It's not issued by any central authority, and this means that theoretically it's, immu it's, it's immune to government interference or manipulation. Now, the most famous uh, example, arguably, of a cryptocurrency is Bitcoin. I won't say anything more about that. Um, I think a second point to note, however, is that these terms um, have been scrutinized a lot more closely, and we start saying that what becomes important is to look at the various functions of a cryptocurrency. Um, it's common to refer to cryptocurrency as, a, as if it was a single concept. However, this is misleading because there are over a thousand cryptocurrencies and they all perform a vast range of functions. 
Um, having said, I wasn't going to mention Bitcoin again, I shall. Uh, but Bitcoin, for example, is really designed to act as a, a cash substitute. And its value is really derived from its usefulness or utility. And this is why we sometimes hear people talking about utility coins or utility tokens. But there are other uh, crypto uh, currencies which really act as a, a mechanism for um, facilitating the operation of, of decentralized structures. Um, for example, secure cryptocurrencies such as Ethereum, um, which are very flexible and can be used in a, a variety of, uh, of, of structures. Now, a more functional approach whereby you look at not what something's called, but what it does, is also important when we start getting into the, the, the question of whether or not a, a cryptocurrency ought to be classified as something akin to a transferable security, or whether it is more correct to think about it as a, a virtual currency, or whether there's some third type of of application. Um, we uh, have, have talked about a, a crypto fuel, which is essentially used to to power, for example, a blockchain. And really, this is the the, the third point that I I wanted to um, to come on to. To talk about, and that is uh, the the use of of, of the, the blockchain um, and the uh, the the importance of the blockchain. Now, s central to the appeal of a lot of cryptocurrencies is is the blockchain technology, and this is essentially used to store an online ledger of all the transactions that have ever been conducted in uh, the particular uh, cryptocurrency. So this provides a data structure for the ledger. Uh, and it's exposed to a limited threat from hackers and it can be copied across all computers running the particular, um, the, the, the particular crypto uh, software. What we say is exciting, and certainly we, when clients have come to us with blockchain technology, but what is exciting in a financial instruments context is the fact that um, people are, are all the users of the blockchain are given visibility of what is on a blockchain, and the blockchain itself becomes a means or place that exchange can occur. And I think this is important as we begin to unpack some of the ideas about how um, things actually happen on the blockchain. And I think this, in turn, makes it easier for us as, as lawyers and consultants um, to advise, and I think for clients then to use these techniques. So with, with that um, almost five-minute introduction, in mind, I think it's important just to not turn to the, the initial coin offering process. Um, and I think what we say to clients really is, is that there are four main points here. The first is the idea, um, uh, really asking the question, why use an ICO? Then, um, as lawyers are always very keen on, the, the documentation. The third point is around marketing. And then the fourth point, which is very important and often overlooked, is, is what happens after the offering um, has occurred. And I think it's important also that to just think about this term offering, um, translating across, say, to a, 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 an initial public offering of securities, we always talk about the offering really being the, the act of um, inviting people to treat, inviting people to subscribe um, for that which you are, are offering to them. So it really is akin to the marketing process and hence the importance of, of tying it to documentation. And I think it's important with these concepts because people will often talk very loosely about regulating ICOs. Is an ICO regulated? And they're generally speaking in the language around marketing or raising the type of language that a, that a securities lawyer would, would use. But there's a, there, there's a further aspect that is important, and that is really the aspect of what, what I guess one would refer to as the broker-dealer or investment advisor aspect, and that is that are there activities being carried on by those advising the ICO provider, those providing the technology, both for the, 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 the initial purchase and then subsequent purchases, is there also room to say that they ought to be regulated? And I think those two forms of regulation are, are very important. Now, diving into the, the actual uh, ICO, and, and I've, I should have moved to the next slide, um, the first question we will put to clients is, well, why, why do you want to use an ICO, or why, why um, use the blockchain? Um, and what is important really is to understand the proof of concept or the unique selling point, which in a sense will go to the commercial reason for wanting to issue 
a um, and, and we're going to use just to use the term crypto t crypto token because that will take in the currency, it'll take in the security, it'll take in the fuel. Um, why use that? Why not, for example, just simply use a normal fundraise? Clients come to us and says, well, we we, we require money for our, our company, um, you know, either in the form of equity or in the form of debt. And we said, well, why don't you just do that? Often they will say, um, no, we have another, another idea. We actually want to create a, almost a closed architecture whereby the coins we or the tokens we're selling are actually utility tokens. Within this closed architecture, people can buy and sell things. Um, others will simply say, no, this is a, a form of financing, but actually there is a genuine investor demand uh, for, uh, for for crypto assets rather than conventional assets, essentially crypto securities rather than securities. Um, we are working with certain clients who are also looking at how um, the tokenization of securities can lead to um, uh, smoother transactions, cheaper transactions. For example, um, if you have a share that individually has great value, by tokenizing that share, you can divide it into, say, 10 parts. For example, I could then sell um, Apple shares to those who couldn't afford them in any sensible amount or, 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 or Berkshire Hathaway shares. So there are a lot of, uh, a lot of potential um, applications that way. I think other questions we will ask besides saying why this, this route is who do you have on your team? And it's important to make sure that vitally important are the coders, and one point we really would emphasize here, we really said that the reason we think of crypto uh, currency or crypto um, assets as such is because of the cryptography for security. It is the role um, of cybersecurity. I know it's a much used term, um, but it is vitally important that one of the biggest threats to the success of an ICO are people being able to, to hack and disrupt or, or worse still actual, actually um, commit theft. And then you also have issues around marketing. Uh, we also throw in their legal advisors because by definition they're important, of course. Um, but really making sure that, that those coming to, to, uh, to market, as it were, are serious about um, the business. We also find ourselves having to advise people on basic governance structures sometimes, saying that if you're going to be taken seriously, you want to have a viable business. So these are all, uh, these are all important points. Next is the question really of, of what is being offered. And I moved on to the next, the next slide. Um, and this is where the classification piece becomes important. Uh, and, and Greg, I know that you're going to talk more about that because I think that has a particular significance in, uh, in the United States. Um, in Europe, we will really look to the function of the particular uh, crypto token, as I mentioned, and ask the questions about what, what is it that it does rather than what is it that we are calling it. And one of the first questions now we'll ask is whether it's a transferable security, and that really is a, a, a European Union term. The significance of that is that if something is a transferable security, you will require an approved prospectus unless you do it by way of a private placement. And a private placement is, is someone, uh, a form of offering that you can do to particular types of investors. Um, we do talk in a similar way we have in the States to accredited investors or else offering to a, a small number of, of people. Um, but that really is the significance there. I'd also mentioned earlier, in addition to the really securities law uh, or offering question of what I refer to as the broker-dealer question, but the question of whether those carrying on activities in connection with the offering would also need to be regulated. Now, in the, the United Kingdom, the, the Financial Conduct Authority, which is um, the, the closest analog to the, the SEC in the US or, or the Securities and Futures um, Commission uh, in, in Hong Kong, um, they issued a statement really warning investors of the dangers of investing in, as they called it, crypto currency, but at the same time saying that cryptocurrency was not necessarily regulated unless it happened to be um, an, an, an investment, a designated investment, or uh, really translating into a transferable security. Again, that, that question around the function of the thing becomes Im important. Um, so that is going to be a threshold question. Some of our clients, and we've been able to argue that what they're offering is more in, in the form of a utility token, actually used almost as a currency substitute or transferring value rather than a security. But one set of clients at least 
are looking essentially to to tokenize or digitize shares, not just for recording, but also for trading in those shares in the blockchain. So it's clear that those are securities. We will make the necessary disclosures. People will get regulated, and we're actually working together with, with the FCA, um, taking clients through that program. The second question is whether um, it could be said that the tokens amount to a, a fund or an or investment contract. Um, and this becomes trickier. I mean, in essence, asking questions around whether there is a, 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 a pooling um, of, uh, of, of the sharing in, in capital or, or profits. Um, I think in, in the US, they also talk about whether something could be an investment contract. And the danger there is that um, you would be subject to restrictions on, on A, how it, it has actually managed um, uh, the, the issuer or people advising the issuer having to become investment advisors, um, the, uh, the, 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 the type of people to whom the coin, uh, at least rather the, the asset can be offered, being limited. So that piece of classification becomes important. In the United Kingdom, there's a very broad and um, almost ancient definition of something called a, a unregulated collective investment scheme. Uh, and there's a danger that, um, that, that certain offerings may be caught in that. The third point is to ask about whether it's, it's a payment services mechanism. And when we read through something, is, what, is, is it the case that actually all that is happening is that we haven't got a virtual currency, but we have a real currency that's simply been digitized and people are, are, are using, um, uh, say, using the blockchain in the guise of a cryptocurrency to simply transfer currency from A to B. That is a regulated activity uh, in Europe under something called the, the Payment Services Directive. And again, if, if the substance of, of what has actually been done is that, I think we would make the argument that you would need to then say that you are actually a payment service. Um, the fourth point is around a commodity. And again, I know Greg is going to talk about the U.S. meaning of that word, but certainly in Europe we are, are talking about something that is, is physical. Um, I mean, uh, the, the, the quintessential commodities would be, um, would, would be precious metals and the like. And certainly here the, the, the rule is that although you can have, um, you can have the derivatives on commodities uh, regulated, um, they are in and of themselves not uh, regulated. Um, I think the final point is to really talk about the three economic types of tokens. I touched on this, but really talking about the crypto transactions or cryptocurrency, those designed for transacting value. Bitcoin is an example. We use the crypto to buy and sell things on the blockchain. The crypto certificate or voucher, and we would say that that really corresponds with the security. Is, is it the case that actually what has been transacted on the blockchain will give you the right to claim um, a, a claim on the capital of a real company, either uh, in, the, in, in the equity or in the debt. And then the final the unusual category, what we call we refer to as crypto fuel, are, are really the, the tokens designed to enable the creation of blockchain-supported applications, the, the, the things that can run the blockchain. Now, that tripartite classification is actually something we as a, a law firm put into the, the UK Parliament that is looking very carefully at how this is all, that, that this is all dealt with. But certainly, I think that the, the question around what is being offered becomes important. We come back to this point about let's look at the function. What is the thing being used for, not, not how are we describing it? Um, I think one point to, to note in passing is there is, of course, a, a very big focus on the regulatory classification of, uh, of, of uh, crypto tokens. But there are also issues, and, and certainly there's been quite a lot of thinking done, and, and we've had to give some advice on what their treatment is um, under the law of property, for example. Can you, what sort of security could you, can you take over crypto assets? How could you pledge them, for example? Are they held on trust or are they held under some, some ancient form of bailment? All these sorts of questions. And I think the, the view very much, firstly, is that the, the, uh, the, the, the crypto assets uniformly are a form of, of real property rather than a, than a money substitute. And as such, um, it is arguable that you can declare a trust over them and certainly take security fixed or floating over them. Those become quite important, I think, in the context of the more advanced, um, the advanced transactions. But I think it's important never to lose sight of, of, of those basic legal questions. What is the thing? Um, you know, how is it lost? How is it stolen? Um, Moving on then to talk a bit about the, 
the documentation, um, and this is more about just getting familiar with with the the terminology, but also understanding some of the risks. Uh, firstly, um, the development agreement will be a key piece, uh, which really goes to to the proof of concept. The white paper, and that is the term of art that is really used to describe the offering document. I have gotten trouble with with some of my U.S. colleagues by describing it as a prospectus, because that has a particular meaning. But in essence, it is it, it is the document that <clears throat> that describes what has been done. Um, the terms and conditions uh, the, the, it could also be a subscription form that actually uh, uh, tell the participants in the ICO what it is they're getting and how it works, what the types of rights are that attach to it. We also have to look at websites. They're very important um, parts of, of, of uh, generally the way that investors come to it. Data privacy, that's a particular um, bugbear and an annoyance in uh, in Europe, particularly after something called the General Data Protection Regulation, and the FPNS stands for a Fair Processing Notice. But increasingly, if you, your website is going to be available in, in, in Europe to make sure that's that. And then the final point is around any associated marketing. But I think the important point in all of that is that the main area of risk in the ICO is really that of mis-selling or fraud. Um, and, and there are commercial aspects. We, we simply say to to our clients, be very clear about what you're telling people um, so they know what they're getting and understand it. Um, it'll be better for your business and there'll be less scope for, for complaint or even worse claims. I think moving on to the question around the risk and governance of the blockchain, this is an important question that does arise. Um, and the question that has been asked by our regulators of clients looking to use uh, use crypto assets and, and blockchain technology for the, the holding exchange of those assets is really the governance around the actual blockchain itself. Um, is, the, is, is the network around the blockchain determined by a single entity or group of users or firms? Um, what role do those participants have um, in, in, the, in the governance of the, uh, of, of, the, um, of the blockchain. The term DLT, just in passing, refers to distribution ledger technology, which is an alternative form. I think the, 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 the pedants will say actually there's a slight difference, but I think we, we use those terms interchangeably. And there are also issues about interests of end users. Um, and there are a number of other, I think, concerns just about the manner in which the blockchain is actually maintained. The word uh, too big to fail has started crawling back into the lexicon of terms in finance when referring to the blockchain. Some have said it's just too vast to fail. But certainly questions we have of clients is, is there a backup blockchain, for example, if you were concerned that, um, that, that, that it might um, it, it, uh, the break down as maybe oversimplifying it. But certainly if we think about it as being the, the place where, um, where, where security assets are exchanged for for cryptocurrencies and vice versa, and all the transactions occur and are seen, um, this idea of the, di the distribution and, and, and the multi-view, obviously the integrity of that blockchain becomes very important, and it is likely um, going forward that that is something that will become more and more scrutinized as, as more and more business is done uh, on, the, uh, on the blockchain. Um, I think also just, just following on from that are those same questions about responsibility uh, for establishing and maintaining a reasonable business continuity plan to the network. Again, the alternatives. Um, issues also around conflicts of interest in the operation or participation in the network. If I'm operating the blockchain but also transacting on it, does that somehow give me an unfair advantage? And also issues around errors and omissions. I mean, the blockchain is just a, 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 a large ledger. Um, and, and should really reflect absolute truth. But the difficulty is if there are fraudsters or hackers about whether what is being seen as a, a misrepresentation. And that really brings us on to, to the, 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 the final bit around what happens when it goes wrong. Um, I think issues around governance and, and responsibility. Who is responsible for the, for the government? Who is responsible for what was said during the ICO? Issues around applicable law. Um, and then I mentioned also the whole thing about a property claim over crypto assets, how they're classified under the law of property if, if one has some type of claim in, 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 in relation to them. Um, the role of the law of trusts is, is very important. And I must say one of the, the exciting things in a lot of the work we're doing is about how we're taking these very ancient concepts in trust law 
and applying them in the context of, of crypto assets. Because, I mean, one thing we're all agreed on is that crypto asset is incorporeal, it's dematerialized, it's a piece of code. Um, but certainly having value, it is something we say that can be held on trust. And then the final piece really is around settlement finality, being absolutely clear that the, the transactions that are undertaken on the blockchain, the purchases and sales are indeed final and shown as such, and that has been transfer of value. All of those concepts, um, well, well-worn legal concepts, but now finding an application in this new environment. And really the, 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 the final point, um, I think around the global uh, the global uh, aspect. Um, obviously, we mentioned cyber risk and, and cyber fraud, and a lot of people say, "Well, that's all very dull, and 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 we know all about that." But uh, we can't emphasise enough that so much turns <clears throat> on that that cryptography aspect and making sure that that works. Issues around market volatility, interconnectedness. Uh, we talk about new pockets of risk. I mean, something that is important to to recognise is how. A lot of risks we have traditionally seen in finance, market risk, uh, counterparty risk, credit risk, um, increasingly now shifted onto questions on operational risk. Um, we talk uh, about the, the, the role of people in understanding technology, KYT, know your tech, um, in the same way that, that the, the executives that were in charge of Bearings Bank when it failed due to a rogue derivatives trade that said they didn't understand derivatives. Um, so, um, uh, and, and we're taken to task for that. So it would be the case that where large financial institutions using technology um, say they never understood it, they will be held to, to, to account for that. Um, and some of the other issues, I think, that, that, that we, we list there, competition and orderly markets, the extent to which a lot of uh, technology will be encouraged um, because of competition con you know, concerns, um, similarly technological issues and, and common standards of governments think we've, we've all touched on. And really the, 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 the final, final point really is on that diagram is looking at how the roles of um, of those involved in finance will change. If we look there really at a, a depiction um, of the blockchain shown as these number of, of nodes and how the buyers and sellers come together um, essentially exchanging uh, crypto assets for cryptocurrency um, with those uh, with those 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 uh, ownerships being 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 um, being reflected, and the change also just in the role of custody. And one of the key aspects around the cryptography is really the so-called key to one's identity. The fact being that what will be held in custody going forward won't be the actual financial instruments themselves, but rather the key to unlocking one's rights or claims on those. Um, and certainly, I think we're already seeing the potential for a lot of disruption, big changes to middle offices, interesting uh, questions around the role of, 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 of even regulatory reporting. So I think all of that gets thrown into this, this new world with these new terms, um, but still we say um, giving rise to a lot of the uh, old and, and, and traditional legal concepts and certainly a number of traditional risks. Well, I think I've probably gone on for about five minutes too long. Um, so, uh, Greg, I'm going to hand over to you. Duncan, it's to you. Thank you, Greg. Um, so I'm going to talk about the approach of the Hong Kong regulators to um, crypto assets, um, ICOs, and, and so on. And I, I think it's, I'm very pleased to be able to give an Asian perspective to this talk because um, I think it's fair to say that the regulatory regimes across Asia have seen some of the biggest moves in recent months in terms of um, regulation in this area. Um, the, the obvious starting point is the, is the outright ban in China, but other countries across Asia are taking steps as well. Um, well I'm going to focus on Hong Kong, which um, particularly since the, uh, the ban that's been imposed in China is increasingly becoming more of a, a regional hub for um, crypto assets. Um, and you can see it on the streets, whether in the form of um, uh, crypto mining equipment being brought across the border for sale uh, or indeed in terms of the activity and the exchanges in Hong Kong itself. And that in turn has increased the importance from the, from the Hong Kong regulators perspective of making sure that um, ICOs and crypto assets are appropriately regulated. So with that in mind, what's the approach of the Hong Kong regulators been to date? And we, there's two relevant regulators in Hong Kong. 
The Hong Kong Monetary Authority, which is um, principally a regulator of banks in Hong Kong, and the Securities and Futures Commission, which is the, the Hong Kong's closest equivalent to the SEC. Um, the HKMA has taken a, a very hands-off approach to date, it's fair to say. They have published a single press release in which they confirmed that the HKMA does not consider a crypto asset a currency, but instead views them as virtual commodities. Um, and the usual disclaimers in terms of uh, warnings to consumers uh, are obviously contained. However, what's interesting is um, the, the indirect um, manner in which um, HKMA's regulations have impacted um, um, actors in this space. And in particular in Hong Kong at the moment, we're going through the process of the fact for evaluation uh, in relation to Hong Kong's uh, anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism, finance and controls. And that has, uh, that has resulted in an upsurge in regulation on the banks. And the indirect uh, impact of that regulation has been on the Bitcoin exchanges operating in Hong Kong, in that they simply have found it very difficult to obtain banking services um, uh, from a Hong Kong bank. Um, and that in turn, uh, effectively um, causes them real practical difficulties in operating. As an exchange, if you haven't got access to a fiat currency, you can't really stay in business. Um, and so turning back to some of the points that Andrew was talking about, um, even where there is not a, a direct regulation, regulation of um, crypto assets or cryptocurrencies in a particular jurisdiction, does not mean that there's not an impact of the existing regulatory framework. Um, and I think we could see more of that in terms of the approach of the Securities and Futures Commission in Hong Kong. They have not rolled out a specific regulation to address crypto assets or ICOs. Um, instead, they have placed their faith in um, existing securities laws. In fact, for some time, it wasn't at all clear whether the Securities and Futures Commission was in, interested in um, crypto assets at all. It wasn't until the end of last year when... Um, it became clear that the SFC was going to seek to um, seek to regulate um, ICOs where appropriate um, using these existing securities laws. Um, and, and the means by which they do so is very similar to the description um, Andrew used in terms of the approach in the UK. The SFC is looking to see whether or not um, the tokens which are the product of the ICO um, might represent um, shares, debentures, or the rather arcane um, collective investment scheme interest. Um, a share um, would, uh, from, from an SFC's perspective, um, they'll be looking for um, whether or not the token received dividends in some way, or was um, the potential beneficiary of the proceeds of a winding up of the, of the issuing company. Um, debenture, if there's evidence that the, the token will be repaid at some point in the future. Um, a collective investment scheme is slightly more nuanced, so I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but essentially what the regulator is looking for is whether or not the token uh, represents a, um, a, uh, a evidence of participation in a, a share of a, of a, um, a pooled investment scheme, um, some form of project for which um, redemptions in the future would be received. And if any of those um, is true, uh, whether it's a share, debenture, or a collective investment scheme, um, then that would fall within the remit of the Securities and Futures Ordinance, and dealing in those securities or advising in those securities would become regulated activities uh, that would require license. I've mentioned futures contracts as well, because obviously we now have derivatives of, uh, of cryptocurrencies, uh, and they would also fall within the ambit of the SFO, and again, dealing or advising in relation to those futures contracts uh, would, be, um, um, would be a uh, regulatory requirement. So what's the SFC done so far? Well, as I said, they, they woke up to the concept of uh, ICOs and, uh, and crypto assets at the end of last year. But since then, they've actually been quite active in taking action um, against uh, ICOs they considered to be securities um, or collective investment schemes, um, or, and indeed the exchanges on which they're traded. 
and uh, the SSC's publicised um, um, its attempts to take ICOs and exchanges to task in this regard, um, and the SSC tells us that they have been successful in persuading ICOs um, to um, to not market their ICO to Hong Kong in circumstances where uh, the SSC considers um, the ICO is a security under the terms of the secu Securities and Futures Ordinance. However, the most well publicized example of SSC action is in relation to a ICO uh, launched by Black Cell Technology, which is actually a Hong Kong um, company. Um, this ICO um, was um, was designed to fund the, the fund the development of a mobile application called Crops, which was a um, agricultural marketplace. And the ICO um, white paper um, should have immediately caused alarm bells to any lawyer that was looking at it, because it refers to itself as the world's first agricultural marketplace crypto equity ICO. And indeed, the uh, white paper goes on to explain that the the crop coins, which were the tokenized um, the tokens um, of the ICO, um, were capable of being redeemed into Black Cell Technologies share capital, um, depending upon how the uh, the crops marketplace was developed. This would seem to be a pretty clear example of an ICO that um, fell afoul of the Securities and Future Ordinance, um, and unsurprisingly, as a result, um, the SSC took action, and Black Cell uh, halted the ICO uh, insofar as it touched Hong Kong's um, market participants. Now, what's interesting is why did the SSC act in relation to this ICO when there's others that might have similar features? Um, and I think the reasons, um, it, reason can be drawn in a couple of places. Firstly, as I've said, Black Cell Technology was a, a company incorporated in Hong Kong, so it was very much on the SFC's stomping ground uh, and easier for it to take active enforcement action against um, if the need arose. And then secondly, the ICO was being actively marketed in Hong Kong. Um, it was an ICO that was um, very publicly marketed, and, and as a result would also have come onto the SFC's radar for that reason. Uh, and thirdly, of course, it, it, it didn't take long from reading the, uh, the white paper to, um, to see the words um, equity, which would have no doubt um, raised concerns on the part of the regulator. I said I was going to talk about collective investment schemes in a bit more detail. And it was actually um, the collective investment scheme bucket that the uh, SFC used as, as um, its, its used as the basis for bringing um, the, the, the CLOPS ICO within um, the remit of the Securities and Futures Ordinance. And the, the, the reason I've called it the, the CIS bucket, the Collective Investment Scheme bucket, is it's effectively a, a depository um, for um, a, a range of different types of um, um, investment scheme, um, which um, require um, prior approval from the SSC before they can be advertised um, in Hong Kong. Um, and as a result, it's, it's a great tool for the regulator to keep control over um, ICOs and other types of investments in Hong Kong um, because they need to see it and, and approve it first. And I think when you look at the features of what a collective investment scheme is, you can see that they they will um, apply or have potential to apply in many of the ICOs that we see coming onto the marketplace today, particularly some of those which are looking to push the boundaries of what, um, um, what features and what benefits a token can bring to the holder. Um, to, for a collective investment scheme um, to operate in Hong Kong, it must be an arrangement with respect to property. Um, the participants of the collective investment scheme um, don't have day-to-day -day control over the property. Um, that's managed by either someone else um, or, or, or uh, with a view to pooling the participants' money um, with a view to giving the participants some form of redemption um, or profit as a result of that part of particip particip participation. Um, and you can see that looking at the COPS, uh, COPS example, um, in that case, 
the, the collective investment was in relation to the mobile application technology. Um, the, the profit or the return was, was the redemption of the Black Cell technology, um, Black, te Black Cell technology shares, um, hence falling within this collective investment scheme bucket. Um, and I suspect this will be the means by which the SFC will look to take action against other ICOs um, in the future um, because it's got this fairly nebulous and wide concept um, together with the fact that in Hong Kong at least, and I think there is some case law in the UK, but in Hong Kong collective investment schemes to date um, have not um, had their parameters closely confined by the courts. And so it's, uh, it's right for the regulator to try and push the boundaries in that particular direction. That was all I was going to touch on for Hong Kong, um, but um, Greg is going to walk us through the um, virtual currency landscape as it applies to the United States. Thank you, Duncan. And before I jump into my portion of the presentation, the public service announcement, if you are interested in receiving CLE credit for today's presentation, please write in the confirmation code virtual currency on your CLE sign-in form, which you will find on your viewing console. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about the evolving regulatory landscape uh, here in the United States. And uh, boy, do we have a long way to go. Um, so uh, the Bitcoin Genesis block uh, was released in January of 2009. Uh, so here we are a little over nine years later, and I think it's safe to say here in the United States, we have no coherent regulatory direction other than some vague promises that something will happen soon. Um, but every day in the news, and I don't know if I'm, I, I suspect I'm no different than most of the people on the phone, when I open up my email every morning and I have all those newsletters that I like to look at to see uh, what's in the legal news in the areas I practice in. There are articles about hacks and thefts and massive amounts of money raised, price volatility, market manipulation investigations, fraud, warnings from our financial regulators, class action filings. I mean, there's so much happening in this space, uh, but there's frankly little direction being given by the hodgepodge of regulators we have here in this country, which I'm I'm somewhat envious of my colleagues in the UK and Hong Kong who have far less uh, cooks in the kitchen, it seems to me. Uh, there is certainly a view of our regulators that these assets, these coins, these tokens have risk, and that's no surprise. We've talked about that a little bit already today, the lack of oversight, uh, lack of safety and soundness measures, um, you know, what happens if there's a mistake or a theft? Who do you turn to to try to remedy that? Um, and there's obviously no deposit insurance either, no FDIC uh, insurance in this space. It's all about investor protection. Uh, and frankly, our regulators are trying to figure out how to apply, in very many cases, old laws uh, to a brand new asset class that I think you could safely say about our Securities Exchange Commission and our Commodity Futures Trading Commission, they never saw this coming. Um, and now here it is for them to deal with. Uh, we have a ton of overlapping jurisdiction here in the United States. We have the Criminal Authority, the Department of Justice, Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which is really derivatives and commodities. The uh, FinCEN, our Treasury Department, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network is involved. The exchanges, both the, the, the spot or cash exchanges, the Coinbase type exchanges, as well as our derivatives exchanges, because as, as Andrew mentioned, we have uh, futures and options contracts on Bitcoin trading on uh, the CME, uh, and we'll have others. There's more coming, I'm sure of it. We have our individual states' attorneys general, um, the criminal authorities in each of our individual 50 states, plus the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the other. Uh, you know, uh, 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 non-state entities in the United States. We have our Security Exchange Commission, the Internal Revenue Service, and then we have state regulators as well, uh, state securities regulators uh, in all 50 states. And so we've got a lot of people who, uh, who have a stake in this area uh, and can uh, issue regulations and enforce the law. So what is it 
Now, what are these things? Are they currency? Is, are they securities? And in this country, it would really be, there's a quite a long definition of what a security is, but people have pretty much agreed that if it's a security, it's going to fall into the category of being an investment contract, very broad category in the definition of a security. Uh, is it a commodity? Is it property? And then the other question that's out there that's yet to be resolved is who's going to regulate this industry? Is it going to be a governmental regulator or is it going to be a self-regulatory organization? And there is a push amongst the exchanges to uh, develop a, a self-regulatory organization along the lines of the National Futures Association for uh, the, the commodity side of the world or uh, FINRA, uh, which is our, our secure, our, our self-regulatory organization in the securities field. Uh, what we've seen recently uh, is the CFTC and the North American Securities Administrators Association, uh, which is state securities regulators as well as provincial regulators in Canada, entering an information uh, sharing agreement really largely focused around uh, crypto assets. The feeling is there is so much fraud out there that, uh, that our governmental regulators uh, at the federal level simply can't handle it and need the assistance of the states. And then we just recently heard an announcement that our Department of Justice and the CFTC have launched a criminal investigation into price manipulation of Bitcoin. Uh, it's unclear whether it involves futures. Uh, the derivative side of it, it appears to be uh, spoofing or wash trading in the spot or the or, or the as best called a spot market rather than introduce cash into this equation. Uh, but that's obviously a big fear is that those prices can be manipulated uh, in the in the spot market, which could potentially um, have an effect on the price of the derivatives as well. So what do we know so far? Uh, we know that the IRS has said uh, crypto assets are property. Uh, they are not currencies. Uh, we have the CFTC, who have said virtual currencies are commodities under the Commodity Exchange Act. Uh, and by definition, the virtual currencies are goods exchanged in a market for a uniform quality and value. That's the definition that the CFTC looked at and said, yes, these are commodities. We have a court who has agreed with them. Um, in the case of the CFTC versus McDonald. Uh, this year, the judge said virtual currencies are commodities. Um, in that case, he made the judge made no distinction between coins and tokens. Um, and in the case, really what he was focused on uh, was the jurisdictional issue. Does the CFTC have jurisdiction over a, a cash or spot market transaction with no nexus to a futures uh, contract? And what the court found is in the case of fraud or manipulation, the CFTC has direct jurisdiction over spot transactions in virtual currency markets. A pretty significant um, development here in the United States. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the SEC who has said, essentially, most people say Bitcoin is not a security. And that's pretty much what we've heard from the SEC in this space regarding Bitcoin. Um, but then again, when you get away from the, 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 the Bitcoin type products and more into the token offerings, uh, the ICOs, uh, the statement from the chairman was he hasn't seen a token offering that is not a security. Uh, and that, that's a pretty strong statement, uh, but we still haven't seen much in that area. Uh, we have a case pending uh, before a judge in the Eastern District of New York, where uh, it's a fraud case against the defendant, and the, the defendant's argument is the, the SEC, the U.S. Doesn't, they doesn't have jurisdiction over him uh, because the tokens from the ICO are not securities and you cannot apply securities laws to him. So that issue is directly before the judge. Are these particular tokens, in this case, a security or not? Uh, and I describe that as a potential re registration tripwire, because if that judge says, yes, there's securities, and it's a very broad opinion, not narrowly tailored to the actual token at issue, uh, it could really uh, cause a lot of, uh, of, 
of registration issues in this country. Um, we see a lot of class actions being filed in this area now. Class action plaintiffs, and there's one that was just filed recently in Ripple Labs token uh, XRP, where they're arguing this token has all the hallmarks of an unregistered security offering without a, an exemption under our Rule 144. So they're saying essentially that uh, these are this illegal sale of unregistered securities, and that's a pretty common claim now that we're seeing class action bar uh, plaintiffs bringing. So what has the SEC actually told us about this so far? Um, there is the case of the DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Uh, it was an offering. Uh, it actually uh, uh, went bankrupt and was investigated. Uh, it's a decentralized venture capital fund. Um, the SEC uh, looked at it into it and issued a report. They ended up not taking any action against the DAO, but they did issue a report and an investigation. It was kind of like, here's how we view um, ICOs. And are they subject to the securities laws? And of course, in this case, they said, yes, DAO tokens are securities under the 70-year-old Howey test. And that's an example. Here we are applying 70-year-old law to this new asset class. And uh, they, it's a very straightforward written uh, investigation report, but I'm afraid that it's, it may not be right. Um, uh, there's a lot of criticisms that the report didn't get it right. Um, that's why I say maybe on this slide. Uh, the analysis of the facts and legal issues and the applicability of the conclusions, frankly, are questionable. Um, so what is the Howey test? In terms of an investment contract, is it an investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profits solely from the efforts of the promoter or a third party? So that's the test that they applied to the DAO, and they said, yes, it is an investment contract. Yes, it is a security. Um, I could get into discussions of horizontal, broad vertical, and strict vertical commonality. I think I'd, I fear putting everyone to sleep if I did that, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions offline about what those particular categories mean. Uh, but important for our analysis here is that in the white paper, or in the investigative report, the SEC said, okay, first of all, it's an investment of money. It need not be in cash. It could be in another cryptocurrency. So that satisfies the first prong of the test. And then they said, oh, yeah, these are investments in a common enterprise, but they gave no analysis, no discussion of those various different types of a common enterprise. And I think that was a failing. Uh, and then they said DAO investors expect profits in the reliance of managers and entrepreneurial efforts of others. And that's really a questionable finding as well because the way the DAO was structured is it was really a decentralized structure. No one held ultimate decision-making authority. All the token holders could withhold their contributions in funding investments. And the promoters of it had the exact same rights as any token holder. There is no real dependence on any special skills or expertise of the promoters. Um, so it's really, frankly, their attempt to shine a light into this area, I would argue, uh, had the opposite effect. So I, well, I do want to say a little bit about, um, about our SROs, our, our, our self-regulatory organizations, FINRA and the NFA, which I mentioned before. So FINRA has said in their uh, 2018 uh, priority exam letter that they may review firms, member firms, compliance mechanisms, uh, where digital assets and ICOs are deemed securities, where ICOs involve the offer and sale of security. Of, uh, sale of security. So basically what they said is if somebody tells us it's a security, we're going to do what we normally do, uh, which is uh, make sure that uh, people are registered, that are supposed to be registered, and are abiding by their compliance obligations. This was, and still today, is the first statement that FINRA has given to any members. Prior statements were all to the investing public, warning them of the dangers of these products. So if tokens are securities, uh, Listing exchanges are going to have to register or operate as alternative trading systems. 
uh, or register as broker-dealers, become members of FINRA. Uh, so that's out there. Uh, the NFA, which covers the security side of, uh, excuse me, the commodity side of the world, um, has, uh, has it a little easier, frankly, because we do have uh, the CFTC say these are commodities. Uh, so the NFA says uh, any new commodity pool operator, or I should say any commodity pool operator or any commodity trading advisor, that's CPO and CTA on the screen, uh, engaging in uh, virtual currency transactions has to abide by certain reporting requirements. Uh, and it's really just identifying the number of pools or managed accounts so that the NFA knows who's in this space and can conduct uh, their audits uh, and investigations of those firms as they see fit. So those are our SROs. And then we've got the states, um, all 50 of them plus a few others. Um, I would say most states are just waking up to this area. Um, they range from totally non-existent in terms of of, of enacting any legislation or regulation in this area to actually establishing some frameworks for virtual currency businesses. Uh, many of them, many states require uh, money transmitter licenses where there's an exchange of virk, virtual currency for real currency, other virtual currency of other or other value. Um, so money transmitter licenses are uh, many, many, many entities now uh, have those licenses. Some of them enacted legislation saying you uh, state uh, revenue uh, authorities have to accept payment of taxes in Bitcoin. So some have gone that way and others have, have started blockchain initiatives really in an attempt to attract uh, this new asset class, these new businesses to their states um, to make them uh, business friendly. So are they securities? Well, that issue still hangs out there. If they are securities, and we're still waiting for clarity on that, then they, those securities will be subject to each state's blue sky laws, which are essentially state securities laws. Uh, and in, the, in that area, there is no federal jurisdiction preemption. You are subject to both state and federal securities laws. So that hangs out there as well. Uh, a couple quick examples, and then we'll break for a couple questions, but I'll just identify New York because I think it's probably the, not surprisingly, the most out front of any of the states in this area. Uh, and they, in 2005, started offering through their Department of Financial Services a bit license. Uh, most uh, financial currency businesses are required to ha have this license to engage in business in New York uh, or with uh, New York customers. So far, only four, uh, there are only four license holders out there. Some have just decided, rather than go through the onerous process of getting this license and being regulated under it, just avoid New York. Um, it does exclude consumers and merchants, so that's an important point. And it really just applies the kind of normal compliance obligations that a broker-dealer uh, or a bank would, would understand, you know, anti-money laundering, cybersecurity, having a complaint process, business continuity plans, record keeping, marketing uh, regulations, consumer protection, nothing surprising there, but that's New York. And then quickly Arizona and Wyoming, which are really states that are opening their arms to this business and saying, please come here. Um, Arizona opened the first regulatory sandbox saying, you know, in, in, to the point of saying that a, a uh, energy companies uh, offering power in the state of Arizona cannot discriminate against uh, blockchain nodes in residence, you know, basically saying, please come here and create uh, 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 Bitcoin and other things like that. And then Wyoming is trying to become the Silicon Valley of blockchain. Um, you can file certain forms in blockchain. Your uh, uh, Bitcoin is exempt from uh, property tax, uh, virtual currencies. You don't need a money transmitter uh, license there. And they actually went as far as to say utility tokens, something Andrew talked about, are exempt from securities regulation. So we have this massive hodgepodge of regulators, existing regulations, trying to apply to this new asset class. And frankly, I think we would all agree that we need some clarity here. 
Uh, and I don't think we're likely to get it anytime soon, uh, but I do think some of the pending court cases and some of the directions from our, our federal judges in particular uh, will start to move the ball. But I think, I think we'd also all agree that judicial rulemaking may not be the best way to regulate an industry and that our regulators and our legislatures really need to step in and fill the void. So with that, I'll pause and if anyone uh, has any questions, we do have a few. Um, there is one, and I wonder if Andrew or, um, or Duncan could speak to the, the view of regulators in, say, Singapore or Hong Kong on ICO buyer sanction screening. Is that something that our, my colleagues can speak to? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to chime in. Um, I think if we, if, we take, if we take a step back and we are thrown into the question that um, the, the token which has been offered is subject to, um, to a, a regulatory uh, regime, then it would follow that the, the need to undertake proper due diligence uh, on that um, would include the need to screen for sanctions um, or any other potential issues. I think a point uh, that, that is, is, is worth noting is that the, the anti-money laundering laws in Europe um, certainly are, are looking to deal with the question of application to, as they put it, virtual currency. And I think acknowledging that virtual currency in and of itself um, is is something in respect of 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 of, of which um, uh, AML screening certainly would be required, um, and and you could and that's really taking taking the currency in in and of itself. If we go one step further, and what we're talking about are are um, crypto assets that are uh, deemed to be um, within the the financial services or securities regime, then the general requirements will, will apply. I mean, one, one of the key commercial issues with, with the ICO is, is really the, the, the compilation of the so-called whitelist. That is all of the individuals that will have access to, um, to, to the blockchain on which uh, tokens are going to be offered. And a key thing in granting that access is thorough and complete um, uh, KYC, know your customer due diligence, and certainly what be, would be included within that is sanctions. We we acted on the first ever ICO in the UK, and for example, we said to our, our clients, and this was an unregulated, uh, this was an unregulated ICO. It was a, it was a, a a coin, a utility token, um, but we said to them, for example, we we don't like the idea of you allowing people to transact on an agency basis or dare even a trust basis. He or she who subscribes um, must be, or the person shown on, on the must must be the actual person. So I think um, those, those issues do arise, and we would say that, that even if, if not mandated by law or regulation, if you're able to squeeze the token of the category, um, it is something that, that, that it would be prudent always to undertake. Great. And if people want to hang on, there's a few additional questions which I think uh, I can try and quickly uh, address. And then if the people who ask the questions would like more information, they can certainly email the three of us. Our emails are at the end of the presentation. There they are. Uh, and, and we'd be happy to answer those questions. But uh, the first one uh, talks about uh, whether the SEC is close to bringing an action against any ICO for failing to register. Um, of course, SEC investigations are confidential, so we wouldn't necessarily know the answer to that. But I think it's, um, I think it's fair to say that the SEC is definitely looking into uh, whether uh, particular ICOs are offering securities and should have been registered. I would be utterly shocked if that's not the case. Um, so I believe that probably within the next year we will see uh, some public announcement of some enforcement action by um, the SEC. And then another question is, should broker-dealers be addressing Bitcoin in written supervisory procedures by specifying registered reps are not allowed to sell to clients or other clarification, even if the regulators 
have not yet spoken on this issue. And I think the answer to that, the prudent answer, and I, I think my colleagues would agree, even if it was not U.S. regulations, would be yes, uh, your written supervisory procedure should address this until there's some additional clarity here in this space. Um, so, Greg, I, Greg can, I, can I also add on that? I think one of the interesting issues is, of course, if, if, if a token is, is classified as a, as a transferable security or security, you're also thrown into issues around insider dealing laws and mark, obviously yep. mismark manipulation. But I think a lot of those processes around personal account dealing and monitoring and all of that suddenly become important too. Because the, you know, if, if, if there is a jurisdiction that is taken um, in the context, say, of an initial offering, then I think there are all the issues around secondary trading um, and, dare I say, uh, you know, customer uh, or investor protection, um, fiduciary duties, those kinds of things may also arise. Yeah. And I think if you're selling, if you're a, uh, a registered rep and you're selling to clients, you open yourself up to all of the types of issues we see in class action case, cases, which is uh, you're promoting these, uh, you said it was safe, um, uh, you said I could li liquidate it any time. You said, uh, you know, it didn't need to be registered. Now I think it did. So I think you really open yourself up to essentially all the claims you see in, in ICO class actions that um, are really picking up steam. Okay. With that, um, we thank you all uh, for uh, listening and attending. Again, if you have any questions for, uh, for Andrew, for Duncan, or myself, please feel free to email us at the emails uh, addresses on the screen there, and we'd be happy to, uh, to uh, answer your questions directly. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.